problem one. So the points coordinates are the x, y, and the z coordinates, minus one, minus two, minus three. So rho squared is uh, x squared plus y squared plus z squared. So rho squared is one plus four plus nine is 14. So rho is going to be square root of 14, because rho has to be positive. Uh, to get theta and phi, uh, we use the uh, xy plane first. So we're at uh, minus 1, minus 2. Here's my point in the xy plane. So here's r. R is going to be uh, square root of 5 from Pythagorean Theorem. And theta is this angle. That's not a special unit circle value. So um, what I would do to find it is uh, draw it over here in the first quadrant, uh, where you're finding its complement, and uh, that angle there, that's the arctangent of uh, 2, and arctangent always returns values in either the fourth or first quadrant. So because, uh, so in this case, it will definitely return one in the first quadrant for something that's positive, uh, arctangent O2. And so in order to get the uh, correct angle, I need to add pi onto that. So theta is going to be arctan 2 plus pi. Then to find phi, I now need to look in the RZ plane. Um, my z coordinates going down, so I'll write it like here's z, here's r. Um, r we already said was root 5, so. And my z coordinate is negative, negative 3. So uh, here is uh, the point. So here's rho, which we know it is already square root of 14, and you could check that again because 5 plus 9 is 14. Um, and then this angle here is phi. Uh, that's an angle in the second quadrant. Um, it's kind of weird because we're measuring it from the z-axis, but uh, I can get that using arc cosine because arc cosine spits back uh, values in the first two quadrants. So phi is going to be arc cosine of, uh, and cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. So uh, this is a little bit of a weird triangle, but uh, my adjacent here is the uh, z-axis is negative 3. So um, negative 3 divided by square root of 14. And I'm done. So my final coordinates are these three. Um, and I'm just going to note, uh, because these aren't unit circle values, there's a lot of ways to describe theta and, um, and phi. And so there's a lot of possible answers to this question. Problem two. Let's find the volume between this elliptic paraboloid and the xy plane. Uh, this elliptic paraboloid is downward facing because the x squared and y squared coefficients are negative. So um, a quick picture for what this looks like. Okay, quick little sketch completed. So it's a downward facing paraboloid and I cut it off at the xy plane. Um, this intersection is actually uh, a circle uh, and you can see that by setting uh, taking this expression and setting z equal to 0. So if z equals 0, you're in the xy plane. Then what you end up with is x squared plus y squared equals 9. So this is a circle 
of radius 3 centered at the origin. So the x and y intercepts are both 3s. Um, so in order to find the volume, what we'll do is uh, integrate the height of um, the function over the base. Um, you could also set up a triple integral, but this works fine. So the volume will equal the double integral over this circle of radius 3. So uh, let's just call this uh, d for disk uh, of 9 minus x squared minus y squared dA. And uh, d is clearly easiest to do in polar coordinates. So putting it in polar, I'd have 0 to 2 pi, 0 to 3, 9 minus, uh, and this is now just r squared. That's my whole integrand, and my dA becomes r dr d theta. And it's always worth checking, this is my r, and this is my theta. And uh, now we should just multiply this out. So this is 0 to 2 pi, uh, 0 to 3, 9 r minus r cubed dr d theta. So the theta is going to contribute us, uh, so these have constant bounds, so the theta just gives us a, d theta gives us a theta. So we get theta evaluated from 0 to 2 pi, so theta equals 0 to 2 pi times um, 9 halves r squared minus r to the fourth over 4 from 0 to 3, so my r bounds, um, and this is going to give you 2 pi. Uh, times uh, 81 halves minus uh, 81 fourths, uh, and that's, that's fine. Problem three. So uh, we're, let me just first, first draw R, so in the xy plane, uh, we're between zero and 1, and let's say this is 0, 1, 2. Uh, so R is this rectangle. Right. Um, so what I should, let's see. Uh, so whenever we're inside of R, the gradient of F looks like for approximately 4 comma 8. So surface area of F over the region R, the surface area of F over R, we know that should be the double integral over R of ds, which is the double integral over R of the square root of Fx squared plus Fy squared plus 1 dA, um, and the gradient of F is approximately 4, 8 on R, so Fx is approximately 4, and Fy is approximately 8. So, in fact, our surface area integral is, uh, I should say, approximately equal to the double integral over r of 4 squared, so that's 16, plus 8 squared, that's 64, plus 1 in a square root, times dA. 16 plus 64 plus 1 uh, is, uh, 6 plus 4 is 10, uh, so that's 20 plus 60, that's 80, 81, square root of 81 is 9, so that's 9, the integral over r dA. And this is just the area of R, and R is a rectangle, so its area is 2 times 1, so this is 9 times 2, also known as 18. Okay, the tetrahedron problems. So to start, I'm going to draw a picture of the tetrahedron uh, so that we have it in our minds. So x, y, z, 1, 1, 
one and this origin. So here are the four points that they've given us. Uh, and if we connect them, that is our tetrahedron. Uh, so it says write down bounds for integrating f in the order dz, dy, dx. So that means uh, your base of your region here is the xy plane. So uh, my x, y base here it's pretty bad, is this little triangle, triangular region. Uh, so my bounds for uh, integrating f over t. So we didn't say what f is, but let's just assume it's a function of x, y, and z. Uh, and then my dA form is dz, dy, dx. So filling in from the outside in x goes from 0 to 1, and then when you're at one of these x values in between 0 and 1, you're starting here and going up to that curve. That's the curve y equals 1 minus x, because it has slope minus 1 and y intercept 1. So y values start at 0, that's down here, and go up to y equals 1 minus x. And then my z bounds, you now imagine that you are at one of these points inside of this, uh, let's color code it, at one of these points in here, and you're integrating up this tetrahedron, but you're stopping at the top of the tetrahedron. Uh, that's a plane, your upper bound. And so we have to solve for what that plane is. And a plane with a whole bunch of intercepts, well, we know it basically has to look like uh, this expression we already have, which is x plus y plus some coefficient of z equals 1. Uh, and I'm getting that from this expression here, which is when z equals 0. Uh, and so it's a plane, so there's just some coefficient of z there. Uh, and you can check in order for this uh, this top point uh, to be you know, to be in the plane, what you need is the coefficient on z to be 1. So you end up with x plus y plus z equals 1. And if you solve, you'll see that z is now going from 0 up to 1 minus, so z equals 1 minus x minus y. Uh, and that's how we do problem 4. Um, and I do want to note, uh, because showing work is important for this exam, um, drawing a picture would be great. Uh, you don't, for a tetrahedron, you should be able to draw a picture, so please draw a picture. Um, giving the equation that you got for the plane is good. You don't have to justify this anymore. Um, I think it's straightforward. Uh, but if you found it some other way, like you, you know, took maybe vectors going along these two edges and then cross-producted them to find the expression for the plane, which you could also do. Um, you, you know, to find a normal vector, implicit formula for the plane. Um, you could show that work, that would be great. Um, it would show me that you know how to do things in the class, and that's the whole point of the exam. So, uh, and showing something like this to get your um, x and y bounds first is also just fantastic. So problem five um, covers something that we didn't really discuss in class, and I wanted to emphasize it because uh, it's not quite fair for me to ask you test questions on this, but I do think this is an important concept for people to have seen and to understand these arguments after leaving this class, even if we're not uh, explicitly testing on them. Uh, and I think you saw some examples like this in your homework. So let's explain a little bit about what's going on here. So what we notice is that this tetrahedron that we have is very symmetric, right? So um, basically, if you have a function that's measuring your x values in this tetrahedron, and instead you replace that with the integral of 
where you're adding up all the y values instead of the x values, uh, all that's really doing is kind of, instead of thinking about x, you're thinking about y. So it's just like flipping the relationship between x and y in this uh, tetrahedron. But the tetrahedron is totally symmetric, right? So like you could imagine reflecting it across, um, you know, a plane that came, I guess it would go uh, something like this, uh, right? If you reflect it across the plane, uh, x equals y, then you would uh, symmetrically interchange two halves of this tetrahedron. And so uh, for every, you know, tetrahedron, so for every point in this tetrahedron that's contributing some, you know, some x value out here, uh, there's an equal point over here that's contributing the same y value when you're adding up the y values. This is all to tell you that the symmetry here tells you that the integral over t of x dv is, has to be the same as the integral of y dv over t. So, um, and in the same way, you could also, you know, the tetrahedron is very symmetric, so you could also do symmetry over um, y equals z, or x equals z, and get that the triple integral of t of z dv is the same. And so there's something, you know, basically, this is just saying that how we label these as x, y, or z, and which one you called x, which one you called y, and which one you called z, didn't matter. T is symmetric with respect to those choices. And so as a result, this integral of x plus y plus z, you can just split this up into a triple integral of x plus a triple integral so dv, uh, y dv plus a triple integral of z dv, and so your final answer is that this whole triple integral of t, x plus y plus z, dv, is just three times what you got for one of them. So three times 1 24th. And that's it. That's the whole argument. So problem six is somewhat similar. Um, because... Uh, up here, the integral for x and the integral for y are equal. This integral here, oops, excuse me, let's move back. This integral here is the same as the integral of x over t dv minus the integral of y. But our argument above said that those two things are equal, so it should be, give you zero. Problem seven is not about symmetry for x's and y's, but it's instead about where the region is. So because our region is entirely happening between zero, x in 0 and 1, um, there's just a relationship between these types of functions for those x values. And so when you're going iterating over the same points, but on one you're adding up x squared, and the other ones you're adding up x to the fourths, the question is really, is each point contributing a bigger number or a smaller number or an equal number? So is the contribution from each point bigger or smaller. Uh, and so what you should look at is just um, an x to like y graph and look at the graphs of y equals x squared and y equals x to the fourth. And so um, on the interval zero to one. And so y equals x squared looks something like this. And over here at 1, it's up at 1, but y equals x to the 4th is lower than that, and then it's 
steeper and it runs through. So they, they intersect at one. Uh, so because y equals x to the fourth is below the graph, um, y equals x to the fourth, you know, adding up the x to the fourth contributions is smaller than the x squared contributions. So our answer should be that the x squared one is bigger. So this page of questions about this tetrahedron, I do want to emphasize they were maybe slightly unfair because it covers the one day of material that essentially got cut out of lecture for the course. Um, so I'm not exactly going to test people on them, but I did want to remind people that this material is, uh, is expected and in future classes you're, you know, people might make arguments like this and they shouldn't feel like total crazy magic. It's often just an argument about symmetry. And I just want people to see that. So for problem eight, uh, we're considering this kind of crazy region. And we're giving limits of integration to compute the volume dz dy dx. So what is always the most useful is to focus on the last two coordinates, the xy plane, uh, and give an image for what the base looks like there. Um, yeah, so x, y. Uh, as x goes between 0 and 1, y is going between the square root of x, so y equals square root of x. Looks like that. And y equals 1. Looks something like that. So uh, in this, so this base, we're considering this upper region here. Um, and that region, if I draw it above, I'm trying not to draw all over this image, but let's maybe uh, draw some, some little bits. So um, this looks like it's my x-axis. Uh, this direction here is my positive y-axis. Um, and this here is my positive z-axis in this picture. So uh, you can see this blue region is uh, this, this portion right here. And so it looks to me like the top of this surface is a plane. z equals 1 minus y. Um, and so you'll note out here, uh, out here where we're at y equals 1, uh, our z plane is down, the, the height of our plane is at 0. And over here when we're at y equals 0, we're up at z equals 1. And I think uh, there's just a little rounding error here on the, like it's, it stopped drawing because it got too skinny. So um, that's, that, that should be the picture. Um, so let's just sort out our bounds. Um, so, uh, I somehow wrote right there. So uh, dz, dy, dx. So my x bounds should go from 0, uh, zero to 1. My y bounds should go from uh, in the y direction. It would be, so you're at a given point x here. You're going up from there to there. So those curves are starting at y equals square root of x and going up to y equals 1. And my z bounds are now starting at the base, at the lowest z. So that's z equals 0 and going up to z equals 1 minus y. So sometimes these are the bounds that uh, you could read directly off the description of R. For problem 9, we need to make things a little harder for ourselves. So we're now going d, z, and dx on the outside. So uh, our x bounds still have to go from 0 to 1 because those are constants and they're just determined by the global bounds on x. But now we need z bounds that are in terms of x. Um, and let's go up and look at the picture to see how they're changing. So when we are at a given um, x-coordinate in between 0 and 1, 
uh, what does our cross-sectional slice look like? From the picture, it kind of looks like it's uh, a little triangular piece like that. Uh, maybe that little, this guy here should be like dotted as it goes through. Um, so you can see, it's often easiest to see them at the boundary. So over here at the boundary, it looks something like that. Uh, and then they're getting smaller as you make these increasing cuts. So what's important to ask yourself for the z-bounds is what is the minimum z-bound at a given x? So if you're at this x, where does where do your z-values start? Oh, they start at the bottom side of this surface. The bottom of this surface is just z equals 0, the xy plane. So our z lower bound is going to be 0. And the z upper bound is that um, upper plane, z equals uh, 1 minus y. But y needs to get out of the picture. So we have to kind of involve square root of x. So what you do is, uh, and so this starts as being an inequality. So z is a less than 1 minus y. And so you say, okay, what does uh, this have to do with x? And you look for where there's a y and an x relationship. And so y at smallest can be square root of x, which means that 1 minus y, I'm going to point out you have this negative. So at smallest, x, y is square root of x. So at biggest, this could be 1 minus the square root of x. Um, and there's that flipping happening because there's a negative. And so this is in fact our upper bound on z here, is that z will be less than 1 minus the square root of x. Um, so let's write that in below. Um, yeah. So it goes from 0 to 1 minus square root of x. And then our y bounds, let's go up and look at the picture as well y in one of these slices is now starting uh, at this, you know, in one of these little triangular slices. It starts here and moves to the right. It starts here and moves to the right. And so the, um, the left endpoint there is being parameterized by this square root curve. Uh, which is a part of a cylinder, y equals the square root of x. So our lower bound is y equals square root of x, and our upper bound is that plane. Uh, and the plane, if we solve for y, is, uh, you know, like where I'm basically taking z less than or equal to 1 minus y and solving for y, and I get y is less than or equal to 1 minus z. And so that's what my z bound is going to be. So what or y bound? Y is in between square root of x and one minus z. Um, so some people like looking at these algebraically. So this y greater than square root of x was in fact one of our expressions we already had. Um, yeah. So our new bounds are going to be um, y equals square root of x and y equals 1 minus z. Problem 10. So for this one, I redrew the picture because it was getting kind of messy up above. So uh, I'm going to start with my z bounds. And so at smallest, z starts at 0. And at biggest, right, right here, z is 1. And so the outer bounds are always like these global mins and maxes. And that's my dz. My next variable is dy. And so if you're at a given z, and then you imagine taking a slice of this piece, it's going to have a bit of it that kind of goes out in this direction, and then cuts back. And it looks something like that. Let's dot the back one. So part of this is on the square root graph. Part of it looks like a straight line, and part looks like the back wall. So it, in particular, it always kind of generically looks like the base down here, um, and that should guide our reasoning. 
So if you're at a given z height, um, your y values are uh, starting over here at y equals 0. That's uh, the xz plane. So the smallest y could definitely be 0. Um, and then at biggest, y has to stop at this plane, and that's the plane uh, y equals 1 minus z. And then now you imagine that you are at a point in the uh, yz plane. Oh, yeah. it also occurs to me maybe you could just look at the uh, the yz base that I have drawn, that little triangle, and you'll discover that this uh, parameterizes that triangle in the yz plane um, using the dy dz coordinate orientation. And so now you imagine you're at one of these points on this triangle. Uh, I'm going to pick this point here. And you're moving out in the x direction. So it's going to look like that. I look at that and realize I'm moving from x equals 0, namely the yz plane. And I'm going up to that square root. Uh, and that square root was, um, this was the graph y equals square root of x which means if I solve for that in terms of x, it's x equals y squared. And that's my solution for that problem. Problem 11. This problem, uh, I give you a polar coordinate plot. So this is a plot in the um, x, uh, y plane, but it's, uh, this is like the polar graphing coordinates, so you can see all the unit circle values a little bit easier. Um, this type of plot, r equals cosine theta, uh, we briefly talked about this. This is one of the ways to represent circles which are tangent to the origin. And so r equals cosine theta graphs out this circle. Um, you can plug in for different points. So uh, if I start uh, at theta equals 0, cosine of theta, cosine of 0 is 1. So I'm out at this point. This is theta equals 0. And then as you go up, Here's theta equals pi over 4, uh, which is rather than being distance 1 out, it's distance uh, 2 root 2. Um, so this distance right here is, uh, sorry, is root 2 over 2. Um, and then when you get around to pi over 2, you're at cosine equals 0, and so you're at 0. And then uh, it traces it out again. So when you're at 3 pi over 4, you're doing uh, this lower portion. So uh, what I want to say is that this is tracing the circle going this way. And after you get to pi, you've done the circle once around. So it does it twice every two pi. So then as a result, all of these have the form uh, that they are integrating some r, some theta over um, uh, Yeah, they're integrating something in polar coordinates. So let's just uh, look at what they are. So um, this first one, and I'm going to draw it in the xy plane. Um, if my theta goes between 0 and pi, and my r goes between 0 and cosine theta, that's the graph I have above. So if I go between... Uh, here, over here, I'm at x equals 1. Here's, here's theta equals 0. And then I go up to uh, this guy here was theta equals pi over 4, just like I drew above. And then here's pi over 2. And then here's uh, this one and this one. That will trace out this whole circle exactly once. So A does trace the circle exactly once um, over this region. So B, let's just switch colors for each one. B is going between 0 and 2 pi. So it's going to do the circle twice. So this is going to give 2 times the area, 2A, if A is giving you area A. 
um, for these next two, uh, c is going between minus pi over 4 and plus pi over 4. So uh, we said at pi over 4, um, yeah, let's just draw this. At plus pi over 4, we're here, and then at 0, so here's pi o over 4, uh, here at, we're at 0, and here's the, re here's the rest of the circle. And then as we go to minus pi over 4, we're going to get this part of the circle. So the area computed for c is only going to be this uh, greedy piece of uh, a pizza pie, or like the complement of a Pac-Man face. But it's missing all of these uh, regions, which I'll shade in red. So C is also wrong, because it's not getting enough area. Uh, but then D. Um, we're starting at plus pi over 2, and as we trace, we go, you know, here's my pi over 4 point, and so I've traced this part, part out, and then I keep going, here's my uh, 0, here's my minus pi over 4, and so I've gone, or, well, it's a little shy, but I've gone a little bit more, and then I at minus pi over 2, I'm, I have traced the whole circle. And so I've traced the whole circle exactly once. So that also computes the actual area of this circle. So the key thing here is, is the region tracing the circle? Does it trace all of the circle? Does it trace it only once? So A is correct because it does the whole circle between 0 and pi once. B is wrong because it does the whole circle twice. C is wrong because it misses part of the circle. And D is correct because it's tracing the whole circle, but it's doing it um, between minus pi over 2 and plus pi over 2, which you should note the length of that uh, is still pi between minus pi over 2 and plus pi over 2, which is why it's getting a whole period of the circle. Problem 12. True, false. So let's explain why some of these are true and why some are false, starting with A. So here's uh, a little picture for A. In A, um, the we're integrating the same integrand, but we're changing the, the region that we're integrating over. So uh, the one I just underlined in blue, that one's going from minus 1, uh, is doing a rectangular region from minus 2 to 1 and from minus 4 to 2. So it looks something like... Uh, this rectangular region. And then the other one, which I'm underlining in red, from 1 to 3, 2 to 5, is going from uh, 1 to 3, 2 to 5. So here's 2 to 5 in the y direction, and 1 to 3 in the x direction, which looks like that. But now the right one is doing this much larger rectangle. And so this bigger one is also catching this and this section. And those were missed by the uh, blue and red rectangles, so you can't add up. And so in particular, if f is just the function 1, both of the left integrals should be computing the areas of these rectangles, and the right one will compute the area of the big green rectangle, and you can't just add up these two smaller rectangles to get the big green rectangle's area. So for b, um, on the left-hand side, what we are computing is the area of a circle. So that's, this is da, oh, so a is false. Uh, B, that's the area of a circle with radius 1, 
going from 0 to 2 pi. So that's, that is uh, pi 1 squared. And we're asking, is that less than or equal to, on the right, that's the area of a rectangle going from minus 1 to plus 1 and minus 1 to plus 1. So that has side length 2. So the area of that is 4. So is pi less than 4? Yes. So b is true. It's just another way of saying 3.14 is less than 4. Uh, for problem C, uh, that integral uh, is the area of a unit disk. I would just draw a little picture to make sure that that's true. So my x bounds go between minus 1 and plus 1. And y equals minus 1 minus x squared. That's a semicircle of radius 1, and it's the negative half of the semicircle. So that looks like this. That's a minus 1 down there. And then y equals 1 minus x squared is the top of the se semicircle. And so this is, in fact, integrating an area form dy dx. Uh, so that is, in fact, dA uh, over the unit disk. So this is the area of the unit disk. Um, Let's do d right here. So d, the left integral, is integrating uh, x between 0 and 1. And then y starts at y equals 0 and ends at y equals x. So the region that we're integrating over is this triangular region. And so the, uh, and then the region on the right is, um, so we're looking at an integral over this triangle, so let's just call this T. And on the right, we're integrating over a rectangle, or a square. Okay, and you might look and say, hey, t is smaller than r. However, the problem here is we're not doing area. We're, doing, we're integrating some function f. So in particular, if f is minus 1, then this computes negative area, which would flip the inequality. Uh, so that's just false. It would be true if f is 1, but it's not true for f being minus 1, and it's also not true for f just doing something different. So you could imagine an f, which is, uh, you know, really, really big on this triangular portion of the region, but super duper negative, you know, really positive on the triangle and super negative on the upper left triangle here. And therefore, uh, it would also form a counterexample. So maybe when you integrate over the square, it would give you 0, but it would give you something positive over t. So, uh, let's zoom out and give myself a little bit more space. So for e and f. Um, okay, so e, the surface area is given by the integral of z dA, and the answer is no. Uh, ds looks like the square root of fx squared plus fy squared plus 1 dA, and this is f, and that's not equal to ds. So that's just not the way we compute surface area. It's not going to work out. Uh, and finally, for f, uh, h is this uh, integral. And then I'm asking about some, uh, this function defined in terms of an integral, and I'm asking about its second derivative, uh, its mixed second derivative. So we need to do fundamental theorem of calculus. So think about this just first for the x variable. 
fundamental theorem of calculus tells me that if I want to take the derivative, uh, let's write it as a partial, partial derivative of h with respect to x, what I need to do, uh, since I'm taking a derivative with respect to x of an integral from 0 to x, uh, is I just need to, you know, of stuff, integral 0 to y, f, s, t, d, t, d, s. What I do is I, since there's just an x up here, I take the x and I plug it in to um, s in my integrand. So let's just tra track. I've got an x. s is being plugged in for s. So uh, h1 looks like uh, so dh dx looks like uh, integral 0 to y f x t dt. And so then h dh d squared h uh, dx dy is going to look very similar, but I'm plugging y in for t. f x t. Oh, <laughs> x y. And that is, in fact, what they gave, so we're good. I just want to point out with this problem, like, you could imagine uh, the reason you got f, x, y is because s and t were plugged in in the same order that they were uh, applied from the outside in. And so x went into the s's and y went into the t's. But if you flip, you know, either your... Um, your bounds of your integral or the order of the integration or how s and t go into f, you could get a different permutation, so you could have gotten f of y comma x. So you do actually have to be careful with these types of problems. Problem 13. I think the easiest way to find the surface area of this region is to draw a picture of the region first. So z equals 4x plus 3y minus 3. This is a plane. Um, and we're looking at this region over uh, this triangle. Um, and so in the xy plane, let's draw that triangle first. That's the point 0, 4. So uh, let's say 1, 2, 3, 4. Here's one of those points, 1 comma 4, so um, 1 comma 4, and 1 comma 0. So you have this little triangle, this right triangle to uh, find the surface over. Uh, and this plane, uh, let's write it as z equals f of x comma y. And so if I compute the z coordinates of uh, the plane above each of these points. Um, at 1 comma 0, we're at 4 minus, so f of 1 comma 0, we're at 4 plus 0 minus 3 equals 1. So at this point, we're at height 1 above it. Uh, at uh, 0 comma 4, we're at 12 minus 3 which is 9. So over here we're at 9. And then at um, 1 comma 4, just can't read. Uh, we are at uh, 4 plus 12 minus 3, so 4 plus 9, which is 13. So since this is a plane, uh, one way to maybe visualize it is that um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be able to draw this to scale uh, just because I'm bad at drawing, is I have a plane, uh, make this more of a line, why not? I've got this plane, and I've got three points. So here are my three points, and they are making a triangle. Uh, and the question is just imagine this is a sheet of paper and you're positioning it in space, right? And so uh, 
each of these points. So this point here is uh, uh, 1, 4, 13. Uh, this point here is um, 0, 4, 9. And this point here is 1, 0, 1. And so if you want to find the surface area inside of this triangle, well, oh, it's, it's a triangle. I could just compute uh, some vectors and do a little cross product. So why don't I find these two vectors and take their cross product? And so let's call this V and this W. So V is um, zero displacement in the X direction, uh, plus four in the Y direction and 12 in the Z direction. And W is uh, minus one in the x direction and plus four in the y direction and uh, plus eight in the z direction. And so the area that we want is going to be one half the magnitude of v cross w. It doesn't matter which order you do it in because they're just taking the magnitude. Uh, and so that's going to be one half times uh, the determinant of i j, k, uh, 0, 4, 12, minus 1, 4, 8. Uh, and so that's 1 half uh, times the magnitude of the vector. And the i component is 4 times 8 minus 4 times 12. So uh, 4 times 8 is 32. 4 times 12 is uh, 48. So 32 minus 48 uh, is negative 16. 42, 32 minus 48, yep. Um, and uh, the j component is minus whatever I get when I do 0 times 8. So that's 0 minus 12 times minus 1, which is plus 12. So that's a negative 12. My k component is 0 times 4 minus uh, minus 1 times 4, so 4. So that's a half the magnitude of negative 16, negative 12, 4. Uh, and so a perfectly fine answer for this would maybe be just uh, 16 squared plus 12 squared plus 4 squared in the square root, and a 1 half in front. You could also do this problem separately uh, using the surface area formalism that we talked about. So uh, if I wanted to do that, I would set up my integral. So for x, uh, I would let uh, f be 4x plus 3y minus 3. And I'm just going to double check that I copied that right. 4x plus 3y minus 3. Yep. Uh, and so then uh, f, fx is 4, fy is 3. And so my surface area should be the double integral over this triangle. Um, in the xy plane uh, of the square root of 4 squared plus 3 squared plus 1 dA. Uh, and so that looks like uh, 16 square root of 16. This is a constant. So I can pull it out in front. And I get 16 plus 9. Sorry, I do need to scroll. Uh, 16 plus 9 plus 1. Uh, so that's 16 plus 10, which is 26. Square root of 26 times the integral of TDA. That's the area of the triangle. And... Fortunately, that triangle was 
a right triangle. And so it had base one and height four. And let's just double check my picture agrees with that. Yeah, it went up to four, width one, yep. So the area of the triangle is four times one divided by two. So uh, two uh, square root 26. And that's a good answer too. And uh, it agrees with this one up here, but you'll see that I could pull out a four square from both of these and uh, these two expressions line up. So um, this one right here, you should think of this as four squared square root times a half times, and then if I factor out that four squared, I get left with four squared plus three squared plus one. Um, and these two things can combine to give me the two square root 26, like below. Um, so, you know, maybe cross products are faster. Maybe if you happen to know that it's coming from an equation from a plane, you can do this surface area computation, and that's a little bit faster, too. Problem 14. So, uh, more true-false for problem A. This is false because... It, it, the domains are the same, so same domains. These are both rectangular regions. Uh, but this would be a um, product rule for integrals, and there's no product rule. Uh, just because there's no product rule for antiderivatives. So uh, for instance, if f and g are both equal to just the function x, uh, when you take an antiderivative of x, you'll get x squared over 2 uh, for each of them, um, you know, in the x variable. But then when you take a product of these, you get x squared, and then, you know, on the right-hand side, this would be x squared, and that would integrate to be x cubed over 3, and, like, how are you going to get that one-third on the left-hand side? It just it will always be false. So, uh, for b, we have that this is false. Uh, this is kind of the related to the earlier true-false problems. So I, however, I switched um, the order of integration here. So just to track, x is going with t and t. So actually, we should be getting f of x blank with x plugged in for t. And then y is going with s. So should be f of yx, not f of xy. That's false. Um, c is just the sum rule for integrals. And this holds true for double integrals when you have the same domain. And so those are the same rectangle uh, minus 2 to 3 in the x direction, minus 4 to 5 in the y direction. And so you can add up. Uh, for uh, d, r is the unit disk. And we're integrating f over r and get, we get 0. Then doesn't f have to equal 0? And the answer is no. Uh, this is false. Uh, for example, if f is just the function x, uh, then it turns out that the double integral over this unit disk is zero. And the reason for that is because the unit disk is symmetric over the uh, line x equals zero. And so the parts of this where x is negative, like, you know, over here, let's give a little, let's give a little x. So that point there uh, is going to cancel like some equal and opposite point over there to the right. And so they, um, they cancel out. Uh, and so this is actually, um, I'm integrating an odd function, I mean, f, f equals x, over a uh, symmetric domain across the origin. Uh, and so that same rule from Calc 1 sort of applies to this problem. Um.
So, uh, and in general, you sh you know, should think just because an integral equals zero doesn't mean the function has to be equal to zero because the function could be positive in some places and negative in another, and they could be canceling. Uh, and so even if you don't have a particular counterexample here, you should be able to say, you should be able to realize that that's just not going to happen uh, or isn't guaranteed to happen. So E, uh, 10 times the area of R is in fact 10 integral of dA over R. Uh, that's how area works. So this is just true. That's the project rule for integrals. And for F, uh, on the left-hand side, we're integrating over uh, as x goes from 0 to 1, so 0 to 1 in the x direction. y is going from 0 up to y equals x. So that's going vertically like that. So here's our region, this uh, lower triangle. And over here for this other one, we're integrating y from 0 to 1. And the line y equals x looks like this. And my x values start at 0 on the inner integral and go up to x equals y. And so we're integrating uh, over this region. And so do these things have to be equal? And the answer is no, because we're integrating a function f, and f could be doing just totally different things on each of these halves. f could be maybe positive here, and it could be negative here. And, you know, that means that the blue, uh, the integral over the blue triangle is going to be negative, but the integral over the red triangle will be positive, and since we don't know what f looks like, we absolutely cannot con uh, conclude that this is true. Problem 15. Uh, there is a typo in this problem. So uh, this 9, that should be a 4 uh, to match up with the other 4s and the 2. Uh, and without that, the problem is um, really, really quite challenging. So let's not do that. Uh, I'm posting this edit. Uh, sorry about this typo. So, um, so let's do this integral. Uh, so what I should do... I'm looking at this, and I see lots of um, things that make me want to translate this to polar coordinates, because I see semicircles and hemispheres. Uh, so I'm going to put things in polar coordinates. So let's first look at the x and y coordinates, so these outer two. Um, and so the things I need to draw, this is y equals square root of 4 minus x squared. That's a positive semicircle. And so uh, for this region, my x values are going between 0 and 2. And my y values start at y equals 0. That's this x-axis. And go up to the semicircle. So my slices look like this. And the region that we're integrating over in the xy coordinates is this uh, quarter of a circle of radius 2. And that means that in polar coordinates, this is theta going between 0 and pi over 2, and r going between 0 and 2. That would be the equivalent way to describe it. And then uh, I look at this and I'm pretty sure I want to go to spherical coordinates because these are hemispheres. So I'm going to look at the R, Z axis and also put that in polar coordinates. So R is going between, uh, over here, R equals 0 and R equals 2. And now my Z bounds, Z is going between minus the square root of 4, but that x squared plus y squared is actually r squared, so that's going to be 4 minus r squared. And z is going up to 4 minus, plus, ooh, just kidding, plus the square root of 4 minus r squared. Uh, so this is describing a circle in the zr 
plane. So let's give myself a little circle radius two. All right. And so when I'm at a given r value, my z values start at the lower circle and go up to the upper circle. So my slices look like that. Since r is ranging between 0 and 2, I'm going to fill out this right half of the circle. Now, this is happening only when theta goes between 0 and pi over 2. So in the x, y, z plane, uh, z, x, y, my thetas are only uh, going through the first quadrant. And for every theta, we get, uh, we get a little picture like this. So for each uh, theta between 0 and pi over 2, we have a cross section like this. And so kind of like our first cross section, when theta equals 0, is going to go, so here's 2. It'll be a little hemisphere. Here's the negative z-axis. Yeah, a little half of a circle like that. And then as you proceed up to theta equals, uh, so here's the theta equals 2 slice. And then uh, at theta equals pi over 2, we'll be pointing along the y-axis. So it'll be a, let's make this a little bit more. It'll be a uh, little half of a circle there. And as I'm ranging, it's like filling out this portion of a sphere. So the region that we're looking at is uh, one fourth of a sphere of radius two. So I could convert this entire integral uh, into uh, polar coordinates or spheric coordinates if I wanted to. Uh, and so uh, over in the z, zr picture, if I'm going to do that, rho is the polar radius here. So it's going between 0 and 2, because that's the radius of the sphere. And phi is telling me how much from the z-axis this region traces out. And so that's uh, phi is ranging in that direction there, kind of going from z to negative z. And it's going all the way from z phi equals 0, which is the z-axis, to the negative z-axis, which is phi equals pi. Um, and so if I wanted to put this integral in, uh, in spherical coordinates, what it looks like would be the, um, I need three bound, three integrals. Uh, theta is going from uh, 0 to pi over 2. Uh, phi is going from 0 to pi, and rho is going from 0 to 2, and my the rest is all a volume form, dv, so my volume form for spherical coordinates would be rho squared, sine phi, d rho, d phi, d theta. Um, but because I have constant bounds, I'm actually really just computing the volume of this sphere, so you don't even need this spherical coordinates version. Uh, all you really need is one-fourth the volume of a sphere of radius 2, which is going to be one-fourth pi uh, times four-thirds r cubed, uh, and r here is 2. So 4 thirds pi r cubed is the volume form. Uh, and that's your answer right there. That looks good. Um, so, but I will point out, like, you know, I'm, I'm going to spherical coordinates in order to understand what my region looks like. And the critical feature here is this xy uh, polar coordinate conversion, because it told me that I'm only doing, getting the portion of the sphere that lives above and below the first quadrant in the xy plane. And that's why I only get a quarter of the total sphere rather than all of the sphere or half the sphere or some other little uh, piece of the sphere.
Okay, for problems 15 to 17, we're working with this cone, with a spherical cap, um, and we're just setting up integrals in rectangular, cylindrical, and spherical coordinates to compute the volume of the region. But uh, cones and spheres are easier to understand in spherical coordinates. So in some sense, the spherical coordinate picture is going to be the easiest one for us to make sense of, and then we can go backwards to get the rectangular coordinates. Um, so up top, I'm going to draw kind of two pictures, uh, or I guess one picture, to make sense of uh, what I'm doing in this problem. And that's going to be my ZR. picture for this little uh, diagram. So whenever we draw the ZR picture, it's like we fixed an angle theta and we're just taking a slice. And so the angle theta you could pick is the one that maybe um, gives the cross section that we're kind of looking at. So if you forget about the 3D portions that are coming out towards you, this looks kind of like it's doing it's got a little cross section like that, like a wedge of pot pizza or a piece of a circle. And so that's my picture for what my cross section looks like at a given r or at a given theta. And so up here I'm at height 10. Oh, and uh, I'm ignoring the left portion because that's that I'll get at theta, you know, plus 180 degrees or plus pi. Uh, so I'm kind of only fo focusing on the positive R portion uh, and ignoring the negative R portion because I'll get it by spinning around. So, so let's just draw some pictures. So um, let's pick this particular slice uh, where my X value is zero. So what that means is that this is actually the slice theta equals zero that we're picking. And so for that piece, uh, this point right here is at, well, I want it in the ZR plane, and what I was given is in the XY plane, but R squared is just X squared plus Y squared, so this point in the RZ uh, coordinates looks like it has R equal to 6, because X is equal to 0, uh, and Z equal to 8. So given theta equals zero. Uh, you could write this coordinate in cylindrical coordinates as zero, six, comma, eight. And that's the one that's going to make the most sense. So six, eight, that's this point. So you should think of it as six, comma, eight in the ZR plane. Okay. And the reason I said that is because actually what we want to know is what's this angle here. And we can find it by, well, here's the triangle. It's a eight, it's a right triangle, length six there. So that angle right there is the arc tangent of six over eight or three fourths. Arc tangent produces values in the fourth and first quadrant, and since we're feeding in three-fourths something positive, this will be in the first quadrant, so it's like the right, it's the correct form of that angle. Um, and I'm looking at this, you know, ZR picture. If I want to describe this region in spherical coordinates rather than cylindrical coordinates, my phi bounds are going to go between zero and this angle, arc, tan, of three fourths, and my row bounds are going to go between zero and ten, uh, and that's how you could describe this little portion of the sphere. So, since we already know theta is going to go between zero and two pi because we can spin this all the way. Uh, around, and it always looks exactly the same. It's not like a quarter of the pi or something like that. Um, we now kind of know all of our bounds for spherical coordinates. So I'm going to scroll down and do that portion of the problem first, and then we'll do the cylindrical one. So uh, let's just zoom out. 
So for spherical coordinates, my volume form is rho squared sine uh, phi d rho d phi d theta. And now I'm going to fill in the portions going outside in. So theta goes from 0 to 2 pi. Uh, phi, we said, goes from 0 up to this arc tan of 3 fourths. And uh, rho goes from 0 to 10 for the radius of my sphere. And so this little cone-shaped portion of a sphere, you can easily describe in spherical coordinates. So I actually think that's the best place to start. And now we can go backwards to get cylindrical coordinates. So uh, for cylindrical and rectangular coordinates, I'm going to kind of copy the work we did above and re-describe uh, some of the uh, picture. So for cylindrical coordinates, I want to go back to that R Z plane, uh, because rather than dealing with this, that was a pretty bad picture, um, let's just go like this, keep extending my z-axis up. Okay, so here's 10. So rather than dealing with this in polar coordinates, what I want to do uh, is describe um, my slices in Cartesian coordinates in the z-r picture, because that's what cylindrical coordinates look like. So my r bounds for this region are going between 0 and 6. And when I'm at a given r value, my z coordinates are going from the bottom up to the top. That's all there is. So I need an expression for this line. Well, it's going through the origin, so it's just the slope of the line. And the slope of the line is um, 8 sixths or 4 thirds. So it's 4 thirds r is that lower line. And this upper um, part of a circle is a circle of radius 10. So that's, if I want to solve for z, z equals the square root of 100, or 10 squared, minus r squared. That looks pretty great to me. And these now give me all my bounds, because we already figured out the theta bound. Uh, so we're reusing that. So to get that, um, I'm going to go... Uh, so let's just write these down. So theta is going to go from 0 to 2 pi. Um, and then I just want to make sure I get my forms right. So for cylindrical coordinates, I should have uh, r uh, dr d theta and dz. So uh, that's r dz dr d theta is the volume form. So my theta form I set up correctly. My r's are just going from 0 to 6. That's not that bad either. But then at a given radius between 0 and 6, my z bounds now have functions in them. So they're going from 4 thirds r up to 100 minus r squared. So to get the answer for problem 16, which I think is the hardest one to express, actually, um, I'm going to also uh, describe things in the xy plane. So I need to go back from polar coordinates to uh, polar uh, to Cartesian coordinates in the xy plane. So my r bounds were going between zero and six, and my theta bounds are going between zero and two pi, and that's just describing a circle of radius six. So I've got this circle uh, of radius 6, and I'm covering all of it, right, in the xy plane. So my Cartesian bounds for x and y, or to get back to rectangular coordinates, I'm going to need to uh, give x bounds, and then uh, y bounds, and then z bounds. So let's set that up. So I'm giving myself the most space to write here because I know these are going to be the messiest. Uh, and I'm going to do dz, dy, dx as my um, order. So my x bounds are telling me my total x range. So I'm going from minus 6 to plus 6 for x. 
My y bounds, though, are now, if I'm at some x value, I need to go from this lower part of the circle to the upper part. And so I should solve for those two circles in terms of x and y. And those look like uh, plus and minus the square root of uh, 36, which is 6 squared minus x squared minus y squared. Um, so that's kind of like the top and the bottom, or y equals those. Uh, so that's going to go from y equals minus the square root of 36 minus x squared. Oh, not y squared. My apologies. Getting ahead of myself. Uh, to 36 minus x squared. Uh, and now in polar coordinates, you know, or my, my z bounds, I need to change them from having r's in them, uh, right here and right here, to having x's and y's. And so the upper bound is the easy one to do. That's, still writing in highlighter, that's 100 minus x squared minus y squared, because r squared is x plus y. But then r, I'm going to replace by the square root of x squared plus y squared. Um, and since r is positive, uh, and my z values are also positive, that's going to be my replacement for this line here. So let's write that in red. So z, I'm thinking about in cylindrical coordinates. So this top one was 100 minus x squared minus y squared. Sorry, I'm running out of space. And the bottom is 4 thirds square root of x squared plus y squared. And that defines um, a cone. So... And that's what my bounds are. So z goes from 4 thirds, the square root of x squared plus y squared, and goes up to the square root of 100 minus x squared minus y squared. Uh, and we're done. So uh, in case you were worried that like cones seem to be hard to describe in x's and y's, I think they are. They're easy to describe in polar coordinates, cylindrical or um, yeah, cylindrical coordinates or spherical coordinates. So you should always think that you're kind of starting from either spherical or cylindrical and working back to get those formulas in Cartesian coordinates uh, because that will help you remember how to use you know, this sort of formula for R to get a cone. Uh, so cones really just look like lines in um, in cylindrical coordinates, and that makes our life a lot easier. Problem 19. So uh, for the last surface area problem, I kind of showed a cheaty way to do it with a um, cross product. But for this one, we're just going to have to use the surface area formula. So um, I'm going to let my function f of x, y be x, y. So then fx is y and fy is x. And now if I want to compute the surface area, well, I'm lying above this region x squared plus y squared equals 4 in the xy plane. Um, oh, I definitely meant that to be less than or equal to, so I'm going to post that also as a correction to this exam, the review. Uh, so that's a closed disk. So what does that look like in the xy plane? Uh, it's the closed disk of radius 2. So take the closed disk and uh, let's convert that. Yeah, I don't know, like, let's just call this D. So the surface area that we want is going to be computed as a double integral over the region D in the xy plane. Let's just put some x's and y's on there. Uh, of our surface area form, ds. And what's ds? It's the square root of fx squared, so that's y squared, plus fy squared, so that's going to be x squared plus 1 dA. Uh, and now I look at this and I say, okay, 1 plus x squared plus y squared, 
I think that would be easier to do in polar coordinates, and my domain looks polar, so I'm going to convert this integral to polar coordinates. So let's get this in terms of theta and in terms of r, and then x squared plus y squared becomes r squared plus 1, and dA becomes r dr d theta. And as soon as you see that, you should be happy because this looks like um, I can do u sub with respect to r uh, in order to solve my, um, my integral, which is much, much easier than what I would have had to do to compute the surface area uh, in Cartesian coordinates, where it's double trig sub. So um, my bounds for theta and r that describe d, r theta goes between 0 and 2 pi, which you, is obvious from the picture. No explanation is really needed. And r goes from 0 to 2 also from the picture. And so now I'll do a little u sub. Um, I'm going to let u equal r squared plus 1. So du is 2r dr. And now I'm just really doing this innermost integral with respect to r. Uh, and so my surface area integral looks like theta goes from 0 to 2 pi. And now that looks like the square root uh, of u, let's just put it entirely in terms of u. So u starts at 1 and goes up to 4 plus 1, which is 5. And this is u to the 1 half. Uh, and I need a 1 half there to get 2r dr d theta. So du d theta. And so if I'm going to integrate that, uh, these now are all constant bounds, so I can do both of these integrals at once. The u to the 1 half integrates to u to the 3 halves times 2 thirds. So I have a 1 half times 2 thirds to cancel the derivative rule. And u is being evaluated from 1 to 5. Uh, so I have that times th d theta gives me a theta, which is evaluated from theta equals 0 to 2 pi. I do think it's good practice to um, put u equals and theta equals on these bounds. If you're not doing that, uh, I think it will save you mistakes and make it easier to read. Um, and then uh, the first one, uh, if I evaluate, this is giving me a third, uh, 5 to the 3 halves. That's, you know, that's just what it is. Uh, minus 1 to the 3 halves, which is 1. Um, and the second one gives me 2 pi minus 0. So I get 2 pi times that, which is, that's, that's fine. You don't have to simplify this anymore. That's a good answer. Okay, so the volume of the solid region above the cone theta equals pi over 3 and below the sphere rho equals 4 cosine phi. So let's, uh, let's draw a picture of this. I think it's easiest to draw this in the RZ plane, um, so in like spherical coordinates. Uh, and then I know that this region, both the cone and the sphere, um, are rotationally symmetric. So my theta is going to go between 0 and 2 pi for both of these. So let's draw the ZR plane. Uh, I'm going to give myself kind of a lot of space for this. Um, so phi equals, let's look at z and r, phi equals pi over 3. That's an angle of pi over 3 from the z-axis. So that looks something like this. So that gives you a cone when you rotate it around the z-axis, right? So you should always be thinking after rotating. Um, and this is just a picture for one of my phi's, or sorry, one of my thetas. Uh, and the sphere rho equals 4 cosine theta this is one of those um, spheres that's tangent to the origin. So cosine theta, if I were to graph this uh, like this, uh, let's go cosine phi. So um, uh, cosine looks like something like this. So, uh, and I'm starting out here at four, going down to zero, and then here we're at uh, minus four, right? So when 
phi is zero, we're actually at distance four. So phi equals zero, that's the vertical z-axis. So I'm up at four, uh, which I don't know exactly where that is, something there. When I'm at uh, phi equals pi over three, because that matters for graphing this accurately, um, so pi over three, uh, I'm up here at uh, cosine of pi over three is one half. So four times a half is two. So I'm at distance two. So if this is distance four, I'm at half that, which means I'm down here. Uh, and so my circle looks something like this. Um, I guess that four should be closer. So let's draw a four. Uh, I mean, I guess I think it should look something like that. Yeah, that looks good. Roughly a circle. Um, and so this is one of these circles that actually at distance two uh, is the center of the circle. Of the circle. And so if you keep going uh, and graphing as phi is down here, so where phi is between um, uh, pi over 2 and pi in this quadrant, uh, you're going to be graphing this negative part of the circle that goes like this. So that's what the circle looks like. Um, so what we're interested in is the part of this uh, solid that's above the cone and below the sphere. Um, and so I think the easiest way to do this is definitely in spherical coordinates. Um, so, uh, and the reason for that is because like this bulge over here, it looks like maybe my circle, there's part of it where I'd have to use both, like two parts of the circle if I were describing this vertically, but radially, if I go out, I'm only ever running into one graph, and it's that circle up until I hit uh, phi equals pi over 3, and then I stop. So I think that the easy way to describe this is uh, taking radial slices, which corresponds to spherical coordinates, and my radial slices start at 0 and at phi equals 0, and stop here at phi equals pi over 3. So the integral I'm going to set up is going to be a triple integral. Theta goes from 0 to 2 pi, uh, and then phi is going to go from 0 to pi over 3, and the red slices are my row slices, and rho starts at 0 because it starts at the origin, and it goes out to this sphere for cosine and then I just need my volume form, so that's uh, rho squared sine phi d rho d phi d theta. So let's, now that we have the integral, just compute it. So um, let's first do my integral with respect to rho. So here's my rows, rho, uh, and here's my bounds for rho. So rho squared d rho, that's going to integrate to be rho cubed uh, times a third. And I'm evaluating rho from 0 to 4 cosine phi. And what I still have left is a sine phi d phi d theta. Integral of phi goes from 0 to pi over 3. Theta goes from 0 to 2 pi. Uh, and now let's plug in. I'm going to go back to black. So theta goes from 0 to 2 pi and get rid of those rows. So phi is going from 0 to pi over 3. Uh, and I have 1 third uh, rho cubed at 0 is 0 and at 4 cosine phi is uh, 4 cubed, which I don't want to bother to compute. Uh, cosine cubed phi sine phi d phi d theta. So this integral, moving up, is, so let's just underline the portion that I'm going to do with respect to phi. 
this looks like a u sub to me. If I let u be cosine of phi, phi, then du is minus sine phi d phi. So I can rewrite that entire integral, the inner integral. So uh, the outside becomes theta equals zero to two pi. I still have these coefficients of so four cubed over three. And now my new integral is u goes from cosine of zero is in fact uh, one. And cosine of pi over three is one half. So I, uh, yeah, and then the interior uh, cosine cubed, that's my u cubed. And the rest is minus du. So I'm going to get a negative on that 4 thirds, uh, 4 cubed thirds, du, d theta. Uh, and now I'm in a position where all my bounds are constant and the integral is really easy. So I'm just going to do both of these at the same time. So I have minus 4 cubed thirds. u cubed integrates to be u to the fourth over 4. So times the fourth. u is evaluated from 1 to 1 half. Uh, and then theta d theta integrates to the theta, evaluated from theta equals 0 to 2 pi, as you've seen a bunch before. And so my final answer is going to be minus 4 squared over 3. And then u, uh, the u section gives me 1 over 2 to the 4th minus 1. <laughs> Uh, and then the theta is giving me a 2 pi minus 0. So, uh, and that's my final answer, and that's plenty simplified for me. Problem 21. I look at this integral, and I immediately want to put it in spherical coordinates because I see that x squared plus y squared plus z squared stuff and I want to replace it with a row squared. Uh, and so I look at that and I'm like, let's go to spherical <laughs> coordinates. I think things will be easier. So, uh, and we're between two spheres in the first octant. So uh, this looks like I've got this inner sphere of radius one, and then I've got a bigger sphere going around it And that bigger sphere has radius 2. And r is in between. r is kind of in between. So uh, in the zr plane, uh, so if I take a slice of this, this looks like two concentric circles. So here's one with radius 1, and then here's one with radius 2. And the region that I'm interested in is uh, this uh, disc with a hole in it. So, yeah. yeah, looks good. Um, so let's go to polar as much as possible. It's already straightforward that this, my theta bounds should be between 0 and 2 pi. Um, to pi, because uh, it is rotationally symmetric around theta, and every slice looks exactly the same. And then describing this region in polar coordinates, so to go all the way to spherical coordinates, uh, it looks to me like my um, phi bounds go all the way from phi equals 0 to uh, phi equals uh, pi, which is the maximal range. And then my rows add a given phi. So here you're at a random phi. You start here and you go radially out. So between these two limits. But each of these spheres, these are just the spheres um, rho squared equals 1 and rho squared uh, equals 4. So rho equals 1 and rho equals 2, because rho has to be positive. 
So my bounds end up being phi is between uh, 0 and pi, rho is between 0, oh, rho is between 1 and 2. Uh, it's a pretty bad row. I'm just going to fix that. And my integral now looks like I've got this triple integral. So let's just call this i. i appears to be theta goes from 0 to 2 pi. Phi goes from 0 to pi. Rho goes from 1 to 2. And what I have inside of there is an e to the rho squared. I have that x. So I need to remember that x is r cosine theta, and r is uh, rho sine theta. So x is rho sine, uh, sorry, rho sine phi cosine theta. Uh, so this is rho sine phi cos theta, and then I have my volume form. So I've got a rho uh, squared, so let's just put those two rows on that row, so row cubed, sine phi, so that sine phi is squared, and then it's d rho, d phi, d theta. So uh, to do this integral, um, I've got a couple steps. I maybe did not give myself enough space here. So uh, the first kind of, the nice thing is that all the bounds are constant. So I'm going to do two substitutions, uh, and let's do them at the same time. So u is going to be rho squared. So du is going to be 2 rho d rho. So that's going to be able to deal with my uh, e to the rho squared and this rho cubed part of my integral. Rho cubed is going to, one of those rows is going to be the du, and the other uh, part is going to be u. So, and then I'm left with sine squared phi cosine theta. Those are two different variables, so I'm just going to have to deal with them separately. So cosine theta, I can integrate to sine theta. But sine squared phi, I need to use a little um, half-angle formula to compute. So what's that going to look like? Uh, let's just write it as a separate detail. So sine squared phi is going to be 1 half, uh, and then sine, so it's odd, so it's 1 minus cosine of 2 phi. Um, yeah, so there's a little half-angle formula. So under these two like different types of substitution, i is now the integral from theta equals 0 to 2 pi, phi equals 0 to pi, um, like how I wrote that zero. Let's go zero. Uh, yeah, so I'm just gonna tweak this. Uh, and rho, well, I'm replacing rho by u, so let's go u equals rho squared, so one and two goes up to four. And now this is e to the u. Uh, one of those rho squareds becomes a u. And the other one goes into the du, but I need a half. So I'm going to put a 1 half du there. Uh, and then I have sine squared phi becomes, uh, so I'm thinking about this. This sits on its own. And then I've got a 1 half, uh, 1 minus cosine to phi, d phi, and then, you know, out here for my last integral, I have also got this d theta, uh, cosine theta, d theta. Believe it or not, we're now in a good shape to do each of these on their own. The hardest one is that u1 in the middle because it's going to require some integration by parts. So I'm going to scroll over and do that one on its own. Because all these bounds are constant, you can do all the integrals at once and just multiply the resulting answers. Um, that always works for rectangular regions. So uh, u equals 
1 to 4, uh, 1 half e to the u du, uh, I on, uh, u e to the u du. So I've unfortunately used u already for my integration, uh, my u sub, uh, and now I have to do integration by parts. And I also used, um, yeah, so I'll use v and w. Uh, so v, and you know what, let me use w for u and e dv. Uh, so to not drive us too crazy. So my W should be U, U and my DV should be E to the U, DU. Then V is E to the U, and DW is DU. And this whole integral will equal uh, WV, so U E to the U minus uh, the integral of E to the U, DU. And the integral of e to the u is, in fact, e to the u. So I can just get rid of that. And I evaluate all of this. Uh, so I also have a 1 half on all of this. I evaluate this from u equals 1 to 4. Uh, so that portion of the integral is going to give me um, 1 half uh, 4e to the 4 minus e to the 4 uh, minus a half e to the 1, which is just e, uh, minus e to the 1, which is also e. And so this part vanishes and becomes 0. So scrolling down, my first portion of i, uh, which I will uh, underline. So this portion is going to integrate and yield me 1 half. Uh, times 4e to the 4 minus e to the 4. Uh, that's also known as 3 to the 4s. Great. Uh, now I'm going to scroll over. My next one is this uh, d phi cosine portion. So that will integrate to be, so I've got a 1 half on it. 1 d phi integrates to be phi, and cosine minus 2 cosine phi is going to look like sine of 2 phi, but then uh, times a half. So a half sine of 2 phi, and phi is going from 0 to pi. Uh, and my last section, cosine phi, or cosine theta, that should be a sine theta evaluated from theta equals 0 to theta equals 2 pi. Uh, and so uh, I've sort of run out of room for each of these, but this looks like 1 half times pi minus uh, sine 2 pi. Sine 2 pi is 0, so that's just pi. And then minus what I get at 0, and sine of 0 and phi 0 are both 0, so it's just 1 half pi. And both of these, both at 2 pi and at theta equals 0, give me 0. So it looks like I magically get 0. Now, this was maybe the painful way to go through the problem, but a slightly more advanced way to, would be to notice that x squared plus y squared plus z squared, that's the region is symmetric when you spin theta around. So uh, those values, those are always positive, those are just something, right? Uh, and the x here is uh, canceling stuff. So the x is odd, and there are an equal and opposite number of points where x is positive and where x is negative in this region. And so because it's symmetric across the plane x equals 0, uh, the positive x and the negative x values are canceling. And you can see that this, uh, you know, could be rectified if you only looked at where x was positive or only looked at where x was negative for this region. And that would correspond to restricting theta so that rather than going from 0 to 2 pi, you are only, if x is only positive, you're going from theta equals minus pi over 2 to theta equals plus pi over 2. And at those two values, sine is not 0. So rather than this turning into 0, you would actually get something meaningful. Um, so this problem was set up both as a way to practice spherical coordinates and integration techniques, 
and as a way to, you know, you could trick your way through this by noticing that the function has to cancel. Problem 22, volume of an ellipsoid. So this ellipsoid, uh, remember, looks kind of like a stretched out sphere. And so it's, uh, here's my z-axis, let's go this way is my x-axis, and this way is my y-axis. So this x point there is intersecting at x equals a, and y and z are zero. This point here is at y equals b, and this point here is at z equals c. It is easiest to do this problem in spherical coordinates but it's only easy if you first transform your x, y, and z uh, coordinates to u, v, w coordinates where you've translated. So what we're first going to do is let u be x over a, b be y over b, and z be uh, c, uh, oops, sorry, v, uh, w, B, Z over C. So in these new coordinates, we're actually, our region, so uh, let's call this E, is our ellipsoid, is now a sphere. Um, uh, so E in these coordinates looks like U squared plus V squared plus W squared equals 1, and that's a sphere. So what, do we, what does this mean? If I want to compute the integral, I should be computing a triple integral over e of dx, dy, dz, let's say, some volume form. And that's the same after I do u substitution. Well, du is 1 over a dx, dv is 1 over b dy, and dw is 1 over c dz. So I need to multiply by a, b, and c for each of these dx, dy, dz's to turn into a du, dv, dw. So this looks like a, b, c, triple integral over e in, uh, let's just call this sphere s in the u, v, w coordinates. So now I'm integrating over this unit sphere uh, of du, dv, dw. And that's a times b times c, those are just constants, times the triple integral over s of dv, and the volume of the unit sphere is 4 thirds pi r cubed, and r here is 1. So my answer is abc 4 thirds pi 1 cubed. So we sort of cheated our way there, but it's actually much easier to not write down, um, not write this down in any coordinate system, uh, but just kind of deform it and then know the fact that we can compute the volume of the sphere, the sphere directly. You could also compute this volume of the sphere using spherical coordinates, so I'm just going to point that out. In spherical coordinates, theta for the sphere is going from 0 to 2 pi, all the way around. Phi has to go over its whole range, 0 to pi. And rho is going from 0 to 1, because of the radius of the sphere. Uh, and dv is now rho squared sine phi d rho d phi d uh, theta. Scroll up. And all the bounds are constant, so you can do each of these integrals separately. So rho squared d rho, that's going to integrate to be rho cubed over 3, evaluated from rho equals 0 to 1. The sine phi d phi integrates to give me minus cosine phi from phi equals 0 to pi. And then d theta is giving me a theta from theta equals 0 to 2 pi. So 
my first portion is giving me 1 third, 1 minus 0, minus cosine phi, cosine at pi is minus 1, so minus, minus 1, and then minus, minus cosine of 0, cosine of 0 is 1, so minus 1. Uh, a lot of things canceling there, but that's a plus 1, plus a 1, so this is 2. And theta is giving me 2 pi minus 0. And so this gives me 4 pi over 3. And it's easy to see that if this 1 were in fact some other radius, uh, so let's say it's some constant d, for radius d, then you would also pick up a d cubed here, which is 4 thirds pi times the radius cubed, as claimed. So even if you wanted to get this integral from first principles, you could still do it at this point. And that's the end of the review.